Hello and welcome to Big Talk with Todd and Noah, presented by Xfinity. Missed last week because we were quite literally not in this country. And Todd, we were back in the States. How does it feel after the excursions of Brazil? (laughs) Feels really good. Feels good to be back on native soil here and uh, back home in Charlotte. But it it was a great experience. Had a a wonderful game to call, you know, in week one of the NFL. And uh, it went down to the you know, the last possession. So it was really fun, uh, fun to be a part of, but, but I am definitely glad to be back in America and back doing college football. It'll be a fun week ahead. As mentioned, that that was perfectly said. We had a great game and the hope is that we'll have a great game again this week as we head out West. Uh, so missed week two, let's recap as we get set with first down here of our third episode of the season. Uh, we're going to start with a concern meter, Todd. So Basically, looking at some of the top Big Ten teams that maybe haven't started the season the way that they were hoping, the concern rating of 1 through 10, 1 being not very concerned and 10 being very concerned. And it feels right to start with the defending champions, the Michigan Wolverines, who we saw week one. And look, they didn't necessarily look like world beaters, but they looked solid. And certainly the defense did. You come back week two, you've got one of the best teams in the country coming to the big house. And Texas really proved that with a convincing win over Michigan, who's dropped now to number 17 in the rankings. Where's your concern meter for Sharon Moore's team? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's at least five, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe even a little higher. And, you know, the thing that we saw in week one that was a concern to me then was, you know, during this turnaround at Michigan in 2021 and 2022 particularly, the strength of the team and the identity of the team was their offensive line, a dominant bullying offensive line that, that, you know, by the time the fourth quarter came, they had worn you down and broken your will. Well, in 23, the year they win the national championship, it was still a great offensive line, but JJ McCarthy also did a lot throwing the football. So they didn't run for as many yards last year as they did the two years prior prior to that. Fast forward to this year, and we even saw it against Fresno State. They, they had trouble with Fresno State's front seven, uh, the, the D-line, the linebackers. They did not establish a dominant run game. So that was number one concern. Everybody focused on the quarterbacks, and that's still a problem because I don't think they have a great answer right now at quarterback. But the biggest issue to me for Michigan right now is their offensive line still has a ways to go. Uh, and, and, you know, the best way to help those two quarterbacks – Davis Warren and Alex Orgy is to have a dominant run game. And they don't have that right now. That doesn't mean they can't get it. And again, you mentioned Texas, Texas is legit. Texas is a legitimate, you know, playoff contending team. They're going to contend for the sec championship. Uh, They were in the playoffs last year. The strength of their team is their offensive line. And, and they showed that, I mean, they, they were the more physical, the better team, from start to finish in that game. So you're talking about one of the elite teams. Uh, so I don't think Michigan has to wholesale make changes and, and go into strict panic mode, but there are areas of concern. And I think it starts with their offensive line. Yeah. And let's not forget the talent level this team still possesses. This is game yeah. two of the Correct. season. There's a new expanded playoff. We've talked a lot about it. If they can figure their, their stuff out, early enough in the season, they can still make a push for that playoff. And you never know what happens once you get on the dance floor. The Donovan Edwards thing does feel a slight concern as well. You, you feel like you've got to get more out of him. And we talked about that during the game week one. It, it just feels like he's got to be a more of a factor for this yeah. team if they want to reach their full potential. Uh, move on to Oregon, because this is the team I feel like most people are probably most concerned about just based on the way right. they won their first two games. They're 2-0, and but neither game has given anybody solace as to, hey, this is a team that can legitimately compete for a title. Yeah, and I think the opposite is true for Oregon. To me, the biggest area of concern is their defense, you know, mm-hmm. and particularly their run defense, you know, and that really showed up in the win against Boise State. They could not stop the run. Now, that kid's a great running back. Yeah, Ashton Jenkins. Best. Yeah, he's probably the best in the country, but – Oregon should be better at stopping the run. And if they want to win and really contend in the Big Ten, they're going to have to be able to stop the run better than they've shown so far in the first two weeks. Uh, I think Dylan Gabriel, you know, they didn't score a lot of points in the in offensively the first week. They scored plenty enough points to win comfortably in the second week. 
but Boise hung right with them. It took a last second field goal to win because their defense gave up 34 points. So I think that, uh, you know, the biggest concern for Oregon is their defense and their ability to stop people and stop the run. And that's where they have to make huge improvements before they get into the big 10 schedule. Where would you put in terms of their, their panic meter right now? Do you feel like it's, it's gotta be high or is it still somewhere in the middle? No, I think it's still in the middle and, and maybe even lower than Michigan's because you know, I think Dan Lenning will get their defense playing better. I think their offense is fine. They've got an experienced quarterback, which is different than Michigan. So, you know, they're going to be able to score and move the ball and do all that. They just got to get their defense figured out. Also got a couple of returns and, and got some points from their special teams, which certainly helps things against Boise State, who, by the way, Boise State's a good football team. That's the yeah, thing. That they've owned is. Oregon, right? They yeah. owned Oregon in the series. So, so I mean, it's a good win for Oregon. But it, it, you know, kind of causes concern around the country because everybody's thinking, well, they're going to challenge Ohio State in the Big Ten. They're going to be in the playoffs. And yep. they still very well may be that, but they've got some work to do. Yep, still in the top ten, so still right there in line. Last team that we'll look at for this first down here, Penn State, your alma mater. Uh, you know, week one, offense really looked like they were pushing the ball down the field a little bit. Week two, they had to sneak past Bowling Green 34-27. Where's your panic meter? Uh, I'm not panicking, but I don't like the inconsistency of it. You know, I mean, they, they look really solid. And, and you know, that first game, they had the long weather delay. They had to come back out of the locker room. You're on the road doing that. And they took care of business. You know, they, they, they controlled that game from start to finish. Bowling Green, I mean, hung around, hung around, hung around. If it wasn't for a couple late interceptions in the fourth quarter – you know, that game could have really gotten away from them, but they never pulled away. I, You know, you're thinking, okay, second half, they'll get after them in the locker room, say, hey, we can't mess around anymore. They'll take care of business the second half. They were never able to distance themselves from Bowling Green. And I don't want to take anything away from my dad's alma mater, Bowling Green. I mean, <laughs> Scott Leffler's a really good coach. It's a good football team. Uh, but Penn State should not have had that much trouble with Bowling Green at home. Now, we're not going to find anything more about Penn State this week because they play Kent State at home and Kent State is probably one of the five worst teams in the country right now so you know we're not even if they score 70 points we're still not going to have everything answered about Penn State until they get into a heavier part of their schedule but you know against teams like that and look I'm from Ohio the Mid-American Conference plays a great brand of football yep. I'm a big fan of the MAC, but at home in Beaver Stadium, 100 and some thousand people, you should be able to put those teams away easier than than the problems they had with Bowling Green. Love me some action, baby. Love me yeah, some action. action. Come on. Uh, I'm also glad to hear that it was a nice, close battle of the Blackledges. That, that always helps yes. things in yes. the Blackledge uh, household. Yeah. All right, let's move over to the second down. Which teams have impressed you the most over the first two weeks? Uh, Nebraska's jumped into the top 25. They feel like they could certainly be in there. Illinois with a big win yeah. over Kansas. They certainly yeah. could be in there. Um, which of those teams have, have really kind of taken your, taken your eye and said, okay, I like what I see? Well, I, I'm impressed by both of them. Now, I would say this about Nebraska. This is what I expected. Now, Please. nobody knew for sure what Dylan Riola would look like in, in live action. And he's been as good as advertised, right? He's he's playing smoothly, playing confidently, throwing the football. And, you know, the thing about Nebraska is they're not asking him to do everything. You know, they're not asking him to throw 35 times a game and put the whole game on his shoulders. They've got good balance in their offense right now. We knew their defense was going to be really good. Their defense was going to be dominant and keep him in every game this year. And so they've got better balance in their offense this year than they had a year ago. And they're taking care of the football. One turnover in the week one, zero turnovers against Colorado. And that is as, as much as anything, that's why they, they are looking the way they're looking right now. They were a little sluggish offensively in the second half, some penalties. They didn't score as much. But uh, I, I'm impressed with where they're at because of their balance and taking care of the football. Now, Illinois, I, I'm more surprised about them. You know, I, it's a pleasant surprise to see them playing the way they are. Luke Altmeyer, you know, he this is his second year as a starting quarterback there. He's off to a great start. Um, you know, and, and look, I'm a big believer in Brett Bielema, too. I think he's a fine, fine football coach. They're always going to be physical. They're always going to play with an edge. And uh, this is an outstanding start because beating Kansas, I mean, you know, 
10 years ago, you might have said, oh, pfft, you know, that's that's a gimme, right? No, Kansas is good. Luke, Luke, you know, Leipold has done a great job turning that program around. And so that's a very impressive win for Illinois in week two. Yeah, I mean, you've got Lance Leipold, who, who kind of built this culture. You know, you bring back an explosive quarterback who's arguably one of the best in the Big 12. That's a team that deserved to be in the top 20 heading into last week. And to your point about Brett Bielema, I'm not saying that this Illinois team is going to be what they were two years ago and this Illinois defense is going to be as dominant as they were two years ago. But we know that his teams are going to play some high-level defense. And last year even, it just felt like Luke Altmeyer turned the ball over far too consistently for them to have any form of success. They're putting too much strain on their defense. He's got no interceptions through their first two games. That, to me, is the biggest development for the Fighting Illini. So a big win for both teams and, and certainly – have turned some heads around the country uh, looking kind of, kind of towards the depth of the Big Ten <laughs> for us on Big Talk. Yes, I agree. I don't know which dog it was, but I that's agree. The little, that's the ferocious little dachshund. Yeah, that's, <laughs> pro, the, protector of, the protector of the house. Protector of the realm. I love it. Yes. Uh, let's move over to third down. So let's preview some of the matchups we've got this week on NBC and Peacock for Saturday. And I would love to start with our afternoon matchup because it's a classic around college football and it's the apple cup. Yeah. You've got Washington and you've got Washington state for the first time. Now Washington in the big 10 and Washington state in whatever you want to call yeah. what that limbo. has all happened. Limbo. Yeah. Limbo. <laughs> That's probably the best way to describe yeah. it. Uh, what do you see in this apple cup as they, as they renew yet another rivalry? Well, first of all, I think it's it, it's one of those great rivalry games. It's it typically was always played at the end of the year during rivalry week in in college football. Uh, it's it's a bitterly contested rivalry, right? Two state uh, schools in the same state, and now I think it'll be even feistier, if that's a word, uh, because of the fact that Washington left and, and joined the Big Ten. And so I think I think there'll be a lot of energy. I think there'll be a lot of emotion in the game. Uh, it's always a fun game. They're playing it a lot earlier than they normally do. Uh, and, you know, we're still figuring out uh, what Washington is going to be all about. Jed Fish, you know, he's off to a good start. A completely remade coaching staff roster. Uh, brought in Will Rogers, the quarterback from Mississippi State, who's off to a good start. He's an older guy, probably has a very calming presence for the guys around him. And uh, But this will be their toughest test so far. And, and again, it'll be a game that, that will mean a lot. It'll mean a lot to both teams, probably maybe a little bit more to Washington State yeah. because this is their shot, you know, at, at their in-state rival. Yeah, it's also their shot to be like, dude, why'd you leave us, man? Right, we could right. we could have kept this thing rolling for years to come. And, you know, I, I would say that a lot of the, the former Pac-12 teams have certainly showed pretty well through the first couple of weeks here of the season. Obviously, U USC being one of the top ones on that list, and they've looked awesome through the first two weeks with Miller Moss at quarterback. Uh, but it's fun to see the Apple Cup. Will Rogers through the first two, 511 yards, five touchdowns. And the fact that he stayed, because that was really the key, right? right. He, he committed there when when uh, Kalen DeBoer was still the head coach. Initially, DeBoer leaves to go to Alabama. Jed Fish comes in. Initially, Rogers entered the transfer portal and said, you know what? I made my commitment. Jed Fish sold him on the future of this program, yeah. and he stayed. And it almost felt like it created some stability in Seattle. So I was glad to see that and glad yeah. to see Washington playing well early. It's going to be fun. Again, that's Peacock 330 Eastern. Uh, you can find everything right there. You can find all our games on Peacock, but you can certainly find our, our primetime game, which Todd and I will be in Pasadena for on NBC as well. 730 Eastern, Indiana at UCLA. I love this, this battle of first-year head coaches here. Yeah. That's what's fun about this. But I'll tell you what, Indiana through two games has looked very impressive. They have. Now, you know, they, they played a team last week and broke the school scoring record with 77 points. Western Illinois has the longest, currently the longest losing streak in college football. And so you can't, you can make something of it. The fact that they're playing with energy, the fact that they're playing with physicality, that they're kind of playing to the personality of their new head coach, Kurt Signetti. Uh, you know, he's a Pittsburgh guy. He's got that Pittsburgh accent. He's got that chip on his shoulder. Came from JMU where he was, you know, hugely successful. Brought a lot of players with him that transferred from James Madison. And so it's a great way for them to start the year. They know, look, things change now. First of all, going on the road, a long road trip. 
and opening Big Ten play. But, you know, as far as how they've looked and how they might feel confidence-wise after the first two games, I think they're probably sky high. And I think Indiana fans uh, should be excited about what they look like so far. But we'll find out uh, when they go out to UCLA because UCLA, at least when they line up against them, it'll be a more fair fight. You know, yeah. the first two games was not a fair fight. They, they should have won those first two games because they just have better people. But UCLA will match them athletically, and they'll match them in size and strength and athleticism. So it should be a fun game. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see UCLA in their week one. They, they beat Hawaii. They went to Hawaii and won. They, they did not play very well. I mean, they were down 10 nothing at halftime. They battled back. They won it on a last-second field goal. Uh, so they're happy with the win, not exactly probably happy with how they played or how they executed, particularly in the first half, but they've had a week off, you know, so they've had a week off to make those corrections, to get better, and now to see what they look like in week three. So uh, it, it should be a very interesting matchup of these two new coaches and, and new programs. Yeah, I mean, look, what Deshaun Foster has on his side is experience. You know, yeah. the quarterback started six games last year. Ethan Garbers' his experience, his running backs, both come back, are experienced. He brings in a guy, Enrico Flores, who we saw at Notre Dame last year, is impressive and played a lot as a true freshman and is a guy who played a lot of high school football in Texas at one of the prominent programs in that state, a state obviously known for its football. They've, they've got experience on both sides of the field. So while it is a, a first-year head coach, he brings a lot of guys that were not just experienced within college football but within that program. And obviously, he was a part of that program as the running backs coach. So there is continuity there. Uh, on the other side, I love that Kurt Signetti, like his whole philosophy was, hey, I can go recruit kids now from the ground zero up and we can start from scratch. Or I can go out to the transfer portal, get a ton of my guys from James Madison, but also go out and find guys who have played. And the quote he had, I think it might have been at media day, was, I want the guys who have been on the field. Because he said, I could go after guys who were two or three on their team that were on a great team and they're just potential, right? We haven't right. seen it. Or I can go get a quarterback from Ohio who has started a ton of games, who has played for years at this point and knows what college football is all about. That's what he elected to do. So it does feel like we've got experience versus experience in this game. And it's going to be fun to see what UCLA, to your point, can do in terms of their adjustments. And it's going to be the first real test for Deshaun Foster to go out there and say, hey, this is what I'm capable of as a head coach. I saw what we did week one or really didn't do. Here's how we're going to fix it heading into week three after a week off. So, yeah. fun matchup. Yeah, it should be. And and I don't know that we know exactly what UCLA is going to look like. I think there's still a lot of unknown with them, you know, because Eric Bieniemy is the new offensive coordinator. Chip Kelly is at Ohio State. So, what is that offense really going to look like compared to what they looked like last year? Uh, showed some of that against Hawaii. What new wrinkles will we see in this game? And then defensively, Danton Lynn, the defensive coordinator, which was a huge loss for UCLA, Absolutely. went across town to USC. But apparently they're keeping the same system or a similar system. So, uh, But we'll see what all that looks like uh, in what I think will be a very entertaining matchup on Saturday night. Yeah, the Danton Lynn thing, obviously we've seen – just what it looks like already at USC. And, and that defense finally looks like they've got the right principles down. They've got the right fundamentals down. And it's made a huge difference. As we move on to fourth down, let's just look at some other mo notable matchups around the Big Ten. We start with number four Alabama going to Camp Randall mm -hmm. for a little jump around against Wisconsin. That is noon on Fox. A, a massive, massive test for the Badgers early. Yeah, it really is. But I think it's a test that they will be anxious to uh, to entertain. You know, they're going to have a great home field atmosphere. Uh, and let me say this. And I don't know if you've thought about this, but, uh, you know, I've done a lot of SEC games in my background, in my history. Right. If you're an SEC team and you're playing a noon game, which in this case would be like 11 a.m. for Alabama time. That normally means you right. stink. You're not good. You're playing on the early like <laughs> SEC network game. Alabama is used to playing in that 3.30 CBS window, right, which is now an ABC window or in prime time. So it's an early kickoff. Uh, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a raucous environment. Uh, certainly Alabama is favored. They're the better team on paper. But, um, but I think Wisconsin, because they will be physical, uh, they're not going to get pushed around by Alabama. 
uh, it, it, it's going to be, I think it has a chance to be a better game than people might expect. Now, two things have to happen, right? Uh, Tyler Van Dyke, the new quarterback of Wisconsin, has to be on point. He has to play well. He has to take care of the football, and he has to give them a good pass-run balance uh, against this Alabama defense. And number two, defensively, Wisconsin has to really take care and, and, and keep in check Jalen Milrow. They can't let him go crazy on him, particularly as a runner. You know, I think if they can keep him in the pocket and force him to throw out of the pocket and not let him get outside and extend plays and do what he's so uh, good at doing, uh, they have a chance in this game. I really think they have a chance. So a couple other ones to look at. I mean, we kind of talked about Oregon. They've got Oregon State on the road, obviously rivalry game. That's always interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 3.30 on Fox. But the one that really catches my attention is Notre Dame coming off the big loss last week. They had so much attention surrounding them. After their huge win week one, it felt like, hey, yeah. this might be the year. Notre Dame is a strong power. They lose uh, to Northern Illinois last week. What an awesome post-game interview with that head coach. Uh, but 3.30 CBS, they go to Purdue. Ryan Walters in year two at the helm of that program. You've got Hudson Card in year two as the starter at that program. They had a bye week to prepare after a 49 right. nothing week one win. I'm very interested to see what the Boilermakers look like against a hungry Notre Dame team. Yeah, I think that's going to be a really inter interesting matchup. And, you know, we, we talked about Luke Altmaier. We talked about Nebraska taking care of the football and, and not turning it over. Same thing with Hudson Card, right? Last year, too many turnovers. He showed flashes, but he had too many turnovers, too much inconsistent play. Well, couldn't be much better than he was in week one. Well, he was like 24 of 25 in that first game. So he's got to be very confident right now in his – command of the offense and how he's playing. Uh, they're playing at home. It'll be an electric atmosphere for Purdue. And you're right. It's going to be a very hungry Notre Dame team. Um, so Notre Dame's defense ha is still there, right? Even though they lost Northern Illinois, they didn't give up a lot of points. They didn't give a lot of points in the win against Texas A&M. So their defense is, is stout. They're legit. Hudson card is going to have to be on point. Uh, and really directing that offense to try to keep them off balance. But it's going to take the, you know, the best game that Purdue has played since Ryan Walters has been there mm. uh, to, to bring another upset two weeks in a row for Notre Dame. So uh, I think Notre Dame will go in there on a mission with a purpose, and it'll be a tall, a tall task for Purdue. I'm sure fans are going to be traveling as well. That's close enough that – South Bend can make the yeah. trip over to West Lafayette, no problem. As we move to our Xfinity, big connections. Let's go back to the Apple Cup, Washington and Washington State's the first trophy game on our family of networks. It'll be on Peacock this season, uh, first of a couple, so we're looking forward to that. But the teams have played each other since 1900. Washington leads the all-time series 76-33-6, and six, has won the last two matchups. They played for the Governor's Trophy from 1934 to 1946. But then the Big Apple Trophy was introduced in 63, the state fruit of Washington. I love trophy games, period. Uh, this one feels like it's just so much fun in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, it really is. And, and, and really, you've got two venues that are very, very different, but both, you know, great home field advantages. So wherever this game is played now, this year, I think they're playing on a neutral site, right? Aren't they playing uh, in Seattle? So mm -hmm. it's a neutral site this year, which is a little bit different. But yeah, I love trophy games. Uh, I think they're awesome for college football. And nobody has more trophy games than the Big Ten. So this this fits right in. And I just want to go back one thing, too. You know, the Oregon-Oregon State game, very, very similar, right? In-state rivals. Oregon State's kind of got that little brother mentality. You know, even though they lost their, their head coach, Jonathan Smith, who went to Michigan State. And by the way, how about a great win yep. for Michigan State and Jonathan Smith? over Maryland in overtime in that last game uh, last week. So, uh, but a lot of pride there. The game's going to mean a lot to them. It's going to be an interesting uh, matchup in that one as well. And that one's always was called the civil wars. So I, I don't think they give a bayonet or anything for the winner of that one, but, uh, but a very intense rivalry nonetheless. Yeah. Both will be awesome and exciting. You can check out the apple cup on Peacock again, three 30 Eastern. Time now for some fan-submitted questions presented by Xfinity. The first one that we have is Will Johnson in the conversation as the best player in all of college football, Todd? 
that's maybe a little bit of a stretch. I think if you're looking, okay, who's the best corner? Definitely in that conversation. Who's the best defensive player? Definitely in that conversation. But, you know, and a lot of people want to draw comparisons with him and Charles Woodson, which I get, you know, they both wear the same number. They've got a relationship. They play corner the same way, similar physically the way they're built. But, Charles Woodson, when he won the Heisman, he was also a returner. He yep. also played some on offense. So he was a little bit more utilized in other aspects of the game. Will Johnson, strictly on defense, a great player and, and a real you know key guy in that defense for Michigan and a key leader. Even though he's younger, he's one of the real leaders on that defense. And I think his leadership uh, this week as they try to rebound from the loss to Texas uh, will be very, very important going forward. Yeah, Sharon Moore mentioned that if he was a senior, because you have to be a senior to be a captain at Michigan, but if he was, or he really said if juniors were allowed to be captains, he would have been voted as a captain this year for the Wolverines. Kind of showcases the type of person he is, practice on and off the field. So he's certainly, I think you you, per, put, you put it perfectly, that he's certainly in the conversation of best cornerback, best defensive back, best defensive player, but right. best player in the country is a – that is a – I mean, look, the Heisman Trophy essentially tells us not necessarily the best player, but close to it, right? The most valuable right. player and someone who's the most impactful player to his team. And, yeah. Well, and the other thing is if you're a corner, which he is, um, you can go away from him as an offense, okay. right? I mean, you can decide we're not going to mess around with him. Now, when we watched Fresno State the first week, they, they went after him a couple times, you know? But who got the pick six at the end of the game when you tried to pick on him a little bit too much? Too much, he returns it for a touchdown. So, so you can kind of take a corner out of the game a little bit by just going away and going to the other side. You know, it's 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 a little tougher to be the best player all around when when a team can do that. So you know what's interesting? I just saw Bill Belichick talking about this. What he did when he had Darrell Revis, and I wonder if more teams will start to deploy a similar strategy. But his whole mentality was he's going to put Darrell Revis, who can shut down basically anybody, especially in his prime, on the number two receiver of the opposing team and double the number one guy. So you're essentially taking away the second option with yeah. one guy and taking away the first option with two. I thought that was brilliant. And I'm curious if Michigan starts to deploy something similar with Will Johnson on one side of the field and just try to take away their number two option and force it to be the, the number three, number four, number five guys who beat you. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting – it is interesting. And, you know, Michigan's defensive coordinator now, Wink Martindale, came from the NFL after 20 years. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him do some creative things with Will Johnson. Yeah. All right, second question. How uh, You already answered this to a certain degree, but we can expand. And I, I do really like that SEC point you made about playing uh, at a noon kickoff. But how can Wisconsin pull off the upset against Alabama? Well, they, they've got to start fast. You know, they can't come out stumbling around, penalties, false starts, those kind of things. Uh, they got to play a clean game. They got to take care of the football. You know, they, they can't be on the on the the negative side of the turnover margin when this game is over. And then that really puts a lot on Tyler Van Dyke to take care of the ball, to deliver the football, make plays uh, offensively, give that offense balance. Um, and then on the other side, they've got to contain – Jalen Milrow, hmm. you know, he's going to make plays. He's a dynamic playmaker, uh, but you are better off if you can keep him in the pocket and make him beat you consistently by throwing the ball out of the pocket. And so, uh, so I definitely think Wisconsin has a, has a, a legitimate shot in this game if they do those things. And if their fans are legitimately engaged, yeah. which we know they will be, and they're legitimately jumping around, and whoever's calling that game is jumping around, and maybe their spotter is doing the same thing and and uh, rubbing up on their shoulders. Who knows what's going to happen? But you can submit your fan questions using uh, the hashtag Big Talk. We can do that every week, and we will answer whatever you got. And can you imagine if they do pull the win, how many beer and brats will be consumed the rest of the <laughs> evening? It will be... Uh, It'll be quite the scene. I would tell you that the answer to that goes to the great philosopher Lindsay Lohan and Mean Girls. The limit does not exist. It'll just be <laughs> constant B and B. Uh, before we get out of here, we got to check in with the Knights guard, Charlotte Christian mm -hmm. Middle School football. Give us the update. 
Yeah, so big win last week. They came back after the disappointing eight to nothing loss, and they blew out uh, Metrolina. Um, it was thirty six to nothing at halftime. They cruised to an easy victory. The good thing is we got they got a lot of the younger kids, a lot of the seventh graders Love in it. the game in the second half. So everybody got to see the field. They're all we're off this week. The the whole school or all the boys are on some kind of a field trip uh, as as a group. So no game this week practice comes back uh, Thursday and Friday, and then we'll get ready for a, a big game against Union Academy uh, a week from Wednesday. All right, I'll get my uh, Union Academy heckling sign <laughs> ready for next week. <laughs> All right, well, we appreciate everybody for tuning in to Big Talk with Todd and Noah presented by Xfinity. Make sure to download and subscribe on the NBC Sports YouTube channel and wherever you get your audio podcasts, and we will talk to you next week with more Night's Guard updates and other stuff. <laughs>